It's not often we have two legends on the stage at the same time, but I'm delighted to say today we have such an exception. So Simon Taylor, well-known doyen of motorsport, broadcasting, journalism, and the voice of Formula One for so many years, and the legend that is Jackie X, ladies and gentlemen, in a year when we celebrate the centenary of the Le Mans 24 hour endurance race, here's somebody who's won it more than most. So I'll leave you to it. Simon Taylor, Jackie X, enjoy your chat. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great privilege to have one of the all-time racing greats with us, Jackie X. Actually, this is the second of these events, and you have a 100% attendance rate, because you were here last year as well. Well, good morning to all of you. Uh, it's fantastic to be to be back uh, and to see all these beautiful cars. And definitely, uh, we share the same passion uh, for classic cars or for for racing. Uh, yes, Simon. I think uh, we did the first one last year, no? Yeah, that that was the first one. But of course, what's different this year? Um, you're, you're a very modest chap, you don't mind talking about your own achievements, but it's a hundred years since the first Le Mans. Um, as a six-time Le Mans winner, you have written your name on that race. So, let's just briefly talk about Le Mans. You did it, I think, 15 times. What, you, you did a lot of long distance sports car races. You were at the pinnacle of that 24 hour races, 12 hour races, 1,000 kilometre races. But what is special about Le Mans? What, what makes Le Mans different? Well, first of all, I think um, you have to know that the record order of uh, wins at Le Mans is. Uh, a Danish guy called um, uh, Tom Christensen and with nine wins he will remain forever in my opinion uh, the record holder. Uh, what is fascinating about um, long distance racing and Formula One and racing generally is drivers normally are the mirrors of those who prepare the cars. Um, the driver and the co-driver in long distance, they are the top of the iceberg, but uh, they pick up the glory, uh, they pick up the glory when things go well, uh, sometimes not when they do some mistakes, but um, Globally, you have to understand that underneath the level of the water, you have um, all these mechanics, engineers, um, designer, people who make the gearbox or the tires. They have in common that they want they want to do the job at 100 percent, and the whole community, the team owner, the drivers, the mechanics, and all these people have in common um, the fascination for car racing, uh, the passion, the desire to do uh, um, the job at 100%, and um, respect for all these uh, people. And, that's why I say about the six wins, yes, we have done it. But we have done it because um, there are some people behind in the shade who do uh, the things humbly, nicely, and these people are just uh, fantastic. Well, let's talk about those teams because you won them all with John Wilder and David York, quite a small team. In those days, things were very different. You won Le Mans, of course, several times for Porsche, which was a much bigger team. Tell us about the difference between working in the 60s with John Wire and David York, that little team, and then working with the might of Porsche. Um, I think also you have to know there will be a Le Mans is, at, uh, is a century of Le Mans. Uh, that's very important to say because. Uh, 
I think we will only leave the, the century one time. That's uh, <laughs> the only certain thing we have about. We know about it, but um, it's fascinating that to know that there is a perennity through the years and through the generation to reach under the years. That means from the origin of motor racing, there have been some organizer, engineers, spectators uh, like you sharing uh, the fascination for the fascination for the sport and. Um, it's really a record on the times, and it's amusing to know that uh, um, the Monaco Grand Prix is uh, 80 years now. Uh, the Mini Media uh, started in 1927, Spa, Francochon, 1922. There are still some races existing after all these years, of course. Um, you mentioned John Wire and David York because I've, I must admit I had a very friendly relation with David York. Um, we were more mercenaries than professional at that time. That means the finance was not the goal in sport. For a team owner or, or for a collector, it was the money. It was just the fusion between the community from the different aspect of the community and uh, life was nice because often you say the sport is dangerous in those days and I think it's an aspect. The danger is not an aspect, so it's important for a driver because if you think about the danger, clearly you're going to be beaten by the other. Uh, to do some risky job, it's, it's, it's a freedom, it's a human freedom, so that's the most important thing to remember. Also in those years, uh, when I say things were definitely more amateurs, but when I speak about the end of the 60s, 70s, uh, Jim Clark was doing some races with the Cortina Lotus, uh, Brabham was racing with a Mustang, Jack Sears, a, a Galaxy, Roy Salvadori was a Formula One driver, uh, was there too uh, with Aston Martin. So, the philosophy is another type of, of life. But you, you, were prepared, you were prepared to, even when you were in Formula One, you were also doing Formula 2, you were also doing sports cars, you were also doing touring cars. Uh, there wasn't the single, single focus of Formula 1 as there is now. And I'm sure you enjoyed all the different challenges of doing the different types of racing at the same time. Uh, I just say this morning when I explained mercenaries, the main goal was to drive whatever the car was. Just as a, an example to give you an idea of far away we are from the business in the sport at the time. Um, it reminds me when I drove for Kentyrell, for example, who was clearly the man who changed me to my life because he picked me up when I was doing some saloon car racing and he put me into a single seater. Um, <laughs> starting fee Formula 3, 50 points sterling. I know the value of the points was higher than today, but uh, still it's a minimum. Formula 2, 100 points sterling. And we were all very happy, we didn't suffer at all. We had a good time. Um, things went more complicated when you had the sponsors also. Because having a sponsor means you dive into uh, the exclusivity. I like the term mercenary because I drove for Ferrari in Formula 1, for Ford in uh, long distance. And a lot of years I was able to do different things like we were all doing for different people because we were not stuck in any kind of exclusivity. 
and that's why we had the chance to meet each other almost every weekend in different type of competitions. And um, we were supported by young kids like you at the time, huh? <laughs> Very young, yes. You, you mentioned Ferrari. Um, I mean, one of the things that fascinates me about your great period of racing is the individuals you mentioned, Ken Tyrrell, an extraordinary, powerful character, even though he was racing from a humble woodyard. Um, you, we mentioned John Wire, um, David York. What about Ferrari? Because Ferrari has always been a firm that was run by one man, it was controlled by one man. How did you get on with Enzo Ferrari? Well, I read the I read often many comments on Enzo Ferrari by other drivers and they always said he's a fantastic man but there was always a but at the end. Uh, frankly, as far as I'm concerned, I never felt any pressure from him. I never felt uh, uh, not served as well as my companion in the team and frankly also I think I've been treated uh, very well maybe I could say like a son in a way and of course the goal was to win whatever the driver was but he remained always a little bit shy on the human aspect because he lived before me, because in the 50s racing was really dangerous and a number of his drivers died in racing and I really think he wanted to avoid to be too close to uh, the drivers because simply it was uh, too painful for him. and. Um, so it shows a different type of tenderness. He had some tenderness. He was not the man you say, cutting like a knife, no. It was someone who loved to, uh, who loved to be uh, the best, like the drivers are. And the only problem, you have one first at the time, so you have all the others are frustrated. But at the same time, it's the same, at the same time, Porsche, for example, one year apart, um, they have the same sort of story. Porsche Ferrari, one year apart, was born one 1947, the other one 1948. So um, they are both iconic uh, cars today, as many other brands, of course, that you can so align here because. Uh, here is the pleasure, it's the pleasure of the eyes for those who love motor racing and that's why you are, you are there. Another thing about uh, endurance racing, which was such a, such a speciality of yours, um, you have to race with a co-driver, you have to work with another driver. And we obviously can always mention Derek Bell because he was a great British um, endurance racer. But if you're racing with the pressure of doing a race like Le Mans and you have to share the driving with another man, presumably the relationship between the two of you has to be friendly, has to work? Uh, first of all, we are both still alive, so oh, it's uh, a privilege. At the moment you asked the question, I was thinking to win races in long distance, you have to be at least two and Clearly, Derek Bell, your that lovely, lovely friend, co-driver, professional, or Brian Redman, or Jochen Maas, or Mario Andretti, for example, um, Jackie Oliver, that we won the Le Mans 69 together. They play, um, they play a key role in two long distance. Also, Although, I have to say, 
it was endurance, called endurance racing because in those days you never knew if building a new car or building a, uh, an Aston Martin or a GT40 or a Ferrari, you never knew if the car was going to end the race because you don't have the sophistication of uh, the test bench and all this thing you have today. Um, long distance today, and Le Mans particularly, and all the 12 force of Sebring or Daytona, uh, today it's a Formula One race. It's flat out, because you know the car will do the distance, for sure. So that's why they need uh, three drivers today. Uh, to make you smile, yes, I can say that, uh, to give you an example, the long straight at Le Mans at uh, 340 km per hour or more than 200 miles anyhow, uh, it's relaxing, it's the place where you uh, can relax. Yes, and you can even see the people having uh, lunch at, uh, in the restaurant in the, the long straight. You cannot, you don't know what they are eating, but you know if your friends are there or not. Um, now, we said earlier that you love to race Formula One, Formula Two, saloons, um, sports cars. Can Am. Can Am, of course, you won the Can Am Championship. Don't let's forget that. Paris Dakar. Well, I've got to come to Paris. <laughs> this is something that you've done later on in real life, an extraordinary achievement, and you won it for Mercedes, I think, for the second for Porsche. And that is a completely different type of, uh, of competition. Well, if it stays between us, or it may be complicated, I think the best part of my life, it's maybe the third one. The Paris Dakar. It was fantastic to do all the things before uh, stage one, stage two. I say that because clearly when I was on uh, long distance Formula One and whatever, the goal was to win. And when you're focusing on only the win, you have a, li a limited uh, angle of vision on what is around you. So, uh, I would call that probably monorail. In the Paris Dakar, you have a fantastic race. Okay, the hardest one probably in racing. Three weeks, uh, 12,000, 14,000 kilometer of off-road racing. Um, you cannot cheat, you have to land back on the planet. Whoever you are, you cannot cheat, you have to be back. And also, you have a vision of the desert. So, when I say landing, it's because uh, you see the reality of life. In the desert, there are plenty of people also, but you can see how small you are, in a way. And how, how unimportant uh, you are, especially if you are if you are tempted to, to fly higher altitude. But much more than that, the second part of that, you have the chance to discover another continent with other people, other type of life, uh, facing different challenges. You have the, possi the possibility to see them. So your vision is, instead of being fairly narrow. You have a vision on the people around you who live on the same planet as us to 180 degree uh, angle. So you can imagine the difference coming from a, a narrow path to a, a super huge uh, motorway. Um, I think intellectually it's a, it's a huge progress. So um, um, to make, to see these people can change your life and you have that everywhere um, on this planet we will be 10 billion people soon um, 
and probably six million of them are living a very hard life. So um, after that, you have to be to feel very granted, not only to to be alive, but to have. Uh, the life we have today, because in the other world, it's uh, it's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. unfortunately, we haven't got what we would like, which is all afternoon or all day to talk to you. I'm going to finish just by saying, happily, we still see you um, around the motor racing scene. We see you, of course, at Monaco. We see you in Goodwood. Uh, we see you at Monterey. Do you still love motorsport? It's changed so much since your day, but Formula One obviously is totally different, but do you still love motorsport? I love motorsport very much because I have been very uh, gifted. And I must admit that I think today I have a lot of duties to the people I didn't see before. But I love the public who makes racing, uh, even if they don't share for me at the time. Huh? I love the idea of having the same other people like you all around, um, having the fascination for Goodwood, for Lord March, uh, um, for the organizer, because without you and without your passion, or common passion, there is no racing possible, and not even Saville, because if the street is empty, it's not the case, the, the case, it's full of people, yes. The mobility, the cars, the names, the great names in, in racing, the great names um, make all that possible. So thank you, thanks to you to have, to have come. It's a wonderful What do you mean about Mauro Forghieri? So he died is, recently, of course. I'm convinced this is an Italian. Um, yes, he wants to hear about Mauro Forghieri. For 25 years, he was uh, uh, the engineer of Ferrari, designing uh, the 512, the BB, uh, all the Ferrari for a long time. Great engineer, disappeared a few months ago. Uh, talented person, who oh, made the success of Ferrari as well, uh, often, and uh, acting with the hands very much like all the Italian do, uh, the country of the best possible uh, food, pasta, and so on, and uh, these people are in Italy who are able to be next to the million media rates, for example, uh, still today, a million people on the road watching uh, this incredible number of beautiful cars who participate in the past um, to the media media. So uh, there is a fan right there who still think about, thank you for thinking about Moro for Yeri. And all the, all the others who are not with us anymore, unfortunately. Well said, thank you for that. And thank you.